paranormal Karen. She's so spooky. Paranormal Karen. Funny too. Paranormal Karen. She's so spooky. Oh, and did I mention she's funny too? Yeah. Cha cha cha. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Paranormal Karen. It, we, I believe we are in February, and um, go to my Instagram or my... Um, I have all kinds of comedy dates and a lot of uh, psychic stand-up shows coming up, so hope to see you there. There is Paranormal Paranormal Karen Paraphernalia uh, f- available on my site. Join the Patreon, Rontowski backslash Patreon, where I do two extra episodes of Paranormal Karen, and I teach tarot and all kinds of things that you want to do. Uh, now, let us jump right in. My guest today, Maya Lisa King, um, I met and uh, so I'm going to say she is, uh, well, you will probably, you're very humble, so you won't like the word master, but she okay. is a mindfulness, uh, let's call you person, which is uh, you teach mindful, all kinds of things. And when I, well, first of all, how are you? How are you doing? I am doing great, Karen, and so happy to be here. So happy. Awesome. So I am going to jump right in with a question that might be kind of hard to answer. But can you explain to people, well, maybe not, what mindfulness is? Yeah, sure. Um, I can, You know, there are a few different ways of interpreting it, but it all goes back to the same thing. So... Uh, one of the popular uh, definitions was given by John Kabat-Zinn, who um, first was one of the first people or the first people of some renown to bring uh, mindfulness teachings to the West. And he was a um, molecular biologist and I think a professor at MIT, maybe. Um, and in the 70s, really brought it over. He had done Zen Buddhism studies and studied with Thich Nhat Hanh and such. And uh, he called it, it's an, it's a basically an awareness that comes from paying attention to the present moment and doing that non-judgmentally. So basically it distills down to being present. Okay. And, and see, that sounds so, so, well, I will say this, uh, there's a, um, uh, there's a wonderful channel on YouTube and I hope to have her on and it's Ryan from rock the divine. And she talks mm-hmm. about when you're getting ready to do medium to for readings, the counting, when you breathe, it puts you right in the moment, it puts you in and that's yeah. where you're available to get information. So it's sort of something like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mindfulness um, includes all the techniques to sort of get to that presence. Usually when people say mindfulness, they're talking about, Everything that includes the meditation, the techniques like you were saying, um, focused meditation, which I think uh, the person you're referring to uses the counting to sort of keep it the focus. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a really great way to practice mindfulness. Um, Loving kindness is sort of another popular meditation for uh, uh, mindfulness, because when we get to that non-judgmental part, that's a really important ingredient. That's a, uh, you know, uh, yes, because basically what it is, is it sounds like it's something simple, but it's very hard to do. And you were saying yeah. you were like getting ready. Was it you that was saying you're getting ready to enter like a two year class on this or something? Yeah, exactly. I, I am a sort of certified in instruction, but I'm going to do another um, instructor certification, um, which I'm really excited about. And it'll be two years long with uh, Jack Cornfield and Tara Brock. So, and so this is, uh, so I guess I'm going to start, first of all, let's start with your journey and then I'm going to get into how this spreads out to be so much. So how did you find mindfulness and how did you start your journey? Okay. Well, that was sort of a two part, um, journey. I mean, I'm sure it's much more than two parts, probably a thousand parts, but let's talk (laughs) about two parts. Um, so I don't, I want to say I was a mindful person, uh, or I was a, I was really immersed in the 3D world. I was sort of a 3D person. I don't know if that makes sense, but, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and then, um, in my, in my early thirties, I was, you know, right. And I had two young children, married job, et cetera, uh, really doing just the day-to-day things and, um, had a very traumatic time with my son. So my very young son um, started getting really sick um, and getting sick. So he would throw up and then end up in the emergency room and 
other things were going on and no one could figure out what was going on. And over, over um, the length of several years, we were we were besieged by specialists because specialists love um, conundrums, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and people were cavalierly throwing around terminal diagnoses, and it was a very very dark and emotional time. The possibility of you know losing one of my children, and um, and the uncertainty of that time, and that sort of pain. I found in my experience, I should say with me, uh, sort of breaks you open. It takes whatever you thought you were and cracks it open Mm. nice and wide for other stuff to come in. And I think you even talked about, I know you've been on this path for a while, but I know you mentioned something when Courage died that 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 the pain of that did something, I think. Am I remembering that right, Karen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So at that time, I started going um, to Pema Children retreats, and I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but she's um, she's a Buddhist uh, nun, uh, author, uh, meditation teacher, and uh, very funny. And I really like <laughs> funny people. One of the many reasons I like you, Karen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, so I started going to her retreats every year in um, at Omega Institute in New York. And that really started me on the path of meditating and, you know, sort of um, uh, going down that road to some degree. But you know what? After a few years and when um, they diagnosed my son eventually with a, a genetic deletion, which has um, certain certain ramifications. He has an intellectual disability and some other things, um, but is healthy and strong. And, you know, once everything wasn't... Uh, um, so scary anymore. I sort of melted back into uh, that 3D world in many ways. And I would say I was even more of a of a striver and a doer, I think, because now reflecting back during that time when I couldn't control anything, now I wanted to control everything. Uh. You know, plan, 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 do, do, do. Um, that uh, I think. Might yes, I know that there it's funny the moment when you realize you have to surrender that type A thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I didn't realize it for a long time. I would just keep doing it. I think no matter what you threw in front of me, I would just keep going toward whatever I was planning to do. I would be like a zombie in a horror movie. Like, you know, they're moving so slowly, but they're just relentless. I would just keep going forward. <laughs> Forget what my intuition says. You know, I lose a leg, I fall five times, I get up and I keep going. I do that. Sometimes I feel like, you know where I still do that? And I, everybody knows it's my problem. Is First of all, I do like flying because I get, I feel like I have no control. Once I get on the plane, I have no control. Yeah. So, but yeah. once they start getting late or we're sitting on, I'm almost trying to will it with my mind. Right. I we're getting there. Don't even ask the pilot. I'm telling you, we're getting there. <laughs> he is not in charge. I'm in charge, and we're getting there. I can identify so strongly with that. <laughs> so um, okay, so you started to get yeah. more three D and and yeah. And- so I really got, and I think I, in some ways, I was I stayed open, but in some ways, I think I got even even more sort of in my thoughts and in my head and sort of that that type of thing. Um, and then that brings us up to, um, just a, a couple of years ago, a little more when I joined a meditation group and, um, we met every day via zoom and I started, to, that stillness, uh, just started to unlock something. And then I, um, was actually going back through my son's medical records, um, for some paperwork I needed. And uh, when I got to the part where he was in the hospital one night um, and had emergency surgery and we didn't know if he was going to make it or not, it brought everything back. And, you know, I was I just brought all these feelings, including all these pains in my body, which I felt that night. It was, you know, it was, I'm sure, what a lot of people who experience trauma feel. And then serendipity brought me to Jessica and Oscar, mm-hmm. who I know you are well aware of. And Jessica works as an embodiment coach and, um, and really helped me. I still, I still um, work with, with Jessica. Um, But at that time she helped me with that particular trauma and working through that trauma and where I felt it in the body, working from there and integrating it maybe is the best word for it. 
um, opened up just a whole new world. I mean, a, a guy popped out who I didn't even know was hanging around. <laughs> Did you say a guy or a god? A guide. A, a guide. guide. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We've been lurking around for who knows how long. Um, and um, after that, it was a, it was amazing. Intuition. I started really understanding intuition and actually following it, not ignoring it. That was a whole new thing. Um, and then synchronicities actually really began in a big way. Really just ones that just brought me to my knees. Like, how is that even possible? Mm -hmm. And that kept leading more and more to mindfulness. And, uh, and I think that everything seems to keep me leading me back to that. I love these other things too, you know, all these tools and these sort of channels of creativity. But for me, I think that stillness is hard to come by and that stillness is where I access everything else. So that's what probably is, is why it feels so foundational for my experience. So, so I love what you said there. So the stillness is where is your found it is what unlocks everything else. So, um, and I want to go back for one second. I'm going to write that, um, unlocks because that's where I want to pick up again. But, um, do you have an interpretation of uh, lately for me, the last week has been unbelievable synchronicity, especially all about Egypt for some reason. I don't know if I'm supposed to go there, but like one after the other, including I, uh, during a meditation, I've been doing, a cacao journeys, um, where you do with mother cacao, which is not mm. like an ayahuasca. I'm going to do a show on it, everyone. So hold tight because, uh, Ooh, great. Oh, here comes the siren. I don't know why we have motorcycles and sirens in the middle of winter. We have motorcycles in the middle of it. I can't, where do I live? It's crazy. Um, the but, hearty souls. Yes. So someone kept showing up when I was doing the cacao uh, journey, a woman with ram horns. And mm. not a dangerous thing, but I was like, what is this? And then I finally Googled it, and it ended up being a um, a goddess, an Egyptian goddess. And like literally wow. that same day, my friend Jennifer Way named her business Hawthorne that is that goddess and like was one thing after another after another and so right now I think we go through periods where synchronicities are just like you said unbelievable like this is coming out of what where I don't know anything about this what do you think synchronicities mean well, I don't know. I've heard people say that it, it just means you're on the right track. Mm-hmm. That's um, what I think. Yeah. And I kind of like that because it is, that's really helpful for me. I like to know I'm on the right track. I think I mentioned the controlling part of my personality before. So it really helps to get a little reinforcement. Um, So sometimes I think maybe they're trying to guide us to something. I do feel like lately the signs, the synchronicities are so big. It's a little bit like the uh, universe is thinking, you know what? She doesn't get subtle. (laughs) <laughs> Let's light this up like a runway for her. <laughs> and and yeah. I really appreciate that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, and do you ever feel, because it's funny because I notice when there's a lot and I don't always notice when there isn't a lot, but I think uh, that's a whole nother, hold on a whole nother discussion about stuff. So, um, so the stillness is, so when you go to meditation and again, this is sort of a weird question, but, and we're going to do a whole, uh, I'll start the second, the whole second half on judgment. Cause that's a whole nother that's topic. Right. But yeah. so do you feel this stillness? Because if I'm right, this is almost like when you're washing dishes, you're just supposed to be washing dishes. You're not supposed to be planning yeah. next week's dinner or where you're going on a trip. Is that sort of what this lifestyle of mindfulness means? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right, Karen. It means that you are, really in the moment with what you, with anything that's happening internally or externally. Um, So yeah, when you're washing dishes, you're washing dishes. When you're eating a meal, you're eating a meal. Um, And I am a, I am a captain multitasker. So this has been a whole new thing for me. Um, But finding that stillness in meditation is really important for me to then bring it out. I'm never going to pay attention to washing the dishes unless I sit down and get still first, because my mind is 
racing in a million different directions. Okay. You just, you just kind of encapsulated like the question in the part of this that baffles me and that I get because, and it's very funny. It's almost funny how I met you at the same time that what I have found is here while I'm in Utica, I finally find I'm finding it better, but I also find that once I step too far into the future or even into the future, there's a panic attack. Like your career Ooh. is failing because you live in Utica, but then it's like, no, why don't you reach out to a club and book a week? You know what I mean? Like once I stay, what can I do in this moment instead of, and, and that has, although I've always known it, it has really been put into action here. And you know what else? And I'm going to say women, but I probably should say people, the world has built up these expectations of what we are supposed to be. And I don't think any of us, I think that's why this whole country has low self-esteem is the mm. expectation of what we're supposed to be is crazy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There are a lot of shoulds. Should do this, shouldn't do that. Yeah, and don't should on yourself is what my friend would say. Don't shy with the- <laughs> right? <laughs> and, you know, um, I would say about your thoughts about, you know, um, well, should I view- move to Utica and, and is this the right thing? Or uh, the one thing about mindfulness that I think would be widely thought is that you don't want to push down those emotions of, of fear or whatever, whatever it is, frustration uh, that you're feeling okay. really make being with them. So being in the moment means also being with your emotions and being with your thoughts. So it really is allowing them to have a place and making friends with them is, is one of the common ways of putting it, but really accepting those into you. I don't know about you, but the more I try to push something away and say that I don't feel this or I shouldn't feel it, the more it comes on. Okay. That's a great place. I'm going to take a break right here. And I want to jump back in with that because that's a very, okay, let's just, we'll do that. We'll be right back folks. Many people are unaware just how much hypnotherapy can help them or think it's only to help lose weight or quit smoking, but there is so much more hypnotherapy can do. It can help with stress, anxiety, insomnia, phobias, performance enhancement, connecting with your spirit guides and higher self. You can even discover past lives and your life between lives. Heal traumas, break habits, find your deepest truth, or just have fun discovering who you really are, all from the comfort of your home. I'm Monique Pliakis. I'm a certified hypnotherapist, and I want to help you. Schedule a free consult by going to www.innerstandingshypnosis.com. That's I-N-N-E-R-S-T-A-N-D-I-N-G-S-H-Y-P-N-O-S-I-S.com. Innerstandings Hypnosis. Find your power and ignite your inner light. Okay, so... Yes, let's, I'll put a lot on the plate right now. I'm sure nothing like your story. Your story is really, you really were thrown into it worse than, I can't even imagine. I don't have kids, but I can't, I don't, one of the reasons I'm not a mom, I think, well, I always said if I met the father, I'd have kids. That was the deal with the universe. And I didn't meet the father, so I didn't have the kids. But the way I was a helicopter mom with courage, I can't Mm -hmm. imagine with children, like I I would have no stomach lining because, uh, and to have yeah, that type of situation. I you know the feeling. It's, it's a feeling you, you have it exactly Karen. And you felt that with courage. It's, it's loving, um, you know, something that feels outside of yourself and not being able to control their perceived safety. Yeah. The other day I saw this, um, these two women were making a funny video and it was a, a big dog owners acting like small dogs owner. And they showed them picking up their dog and running to the side, like, Oh no, oh no. <laughs> and it was kind of funny, but also I would love to meet those women and tell them, yeah, a big dog broke his back from someone that he said he's friendly. And the dog was being friendly and jumped on courage and broke his back. Oh so, my goodness. You were kidding. No. And that's when he was oh. like five and it was an issue all the way. But I was like, it's one of those things where I'm a comedian, so I can't really go. That's not funny. But for me, it wasn't funny it's at not all. That funny. <laughs> no, not you funny. try it. Yeah. Let me break your dog's back and then see how you I'm feel. Kidding. But oh. um, yeah, but it, you know, humor's always got to have a victim and that's the truth. So mm-hmm. when let's say, um, With everything going on with my parents, which is really bizarre, because it's bizarre to watch people deteriorate 
in front of you. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I will be with them and everything's okay. Me and my sister both have this, like, everything's great. We're doing the best we can. We're trying to answer that same question a hundred times. And then all of a sudden, like my chest, I want to jump out of my skin and I kind of have to leave them at their place and go. And it's Mm -hmm. like that feeling in your, uh, I'm going to say in my chest where it's like, you got to get out of here. You got to escape this. What would be your advice to do at that point? Sure. I can give you some advice. Um, And if it's okay, I'd like to talk a little about um, the physiology of the brain. Sure. Which which I just think is really interesting. I might be, (laughs) I hope others think it's interesting too. Um, But it's not that the physiology of the brain or neurology is the end all. We, We both very much, I know, and everyone listening do not feel that way. But it is our nervous system and how we sort of react with our physical world. So what's happening, knowing what's happening there can be helpful. Anyway, when we feel um, under threat, our amygdala or the reptilian part of the brain is is um, activated. So, um, the when you feel like something is is wrong with your parents or you're worried about them, um, the amygdala gets activated, and the amygdala has been getting activated since we were first humans first came around. And um, I'm not, have you ever heard of something called the negativity bias? Uh, I've heard of it, but uh, uh, go ahead. Yes. I, it's not so ringing about. It's it's got several layers, but in in essence, it's it's the reason why at the end of the day, when someone says, "Hey, how was your day?" you don't say, "Oh, I had this great lunch," or "This person said I did this really well." You say, "Oh my God, you wouldn't believe what this guy said to me." Uh, the one thing, you know, I have 20 good things, the one bad thing right. feels like the biggest thing. And at least I ruminate over it all night. Oh, know? yeah. I replay it. I replay yeah. I replay moments of my life that were horrible, it, just excluding everything great that happened. I go over right. and over. Right. Especially waking up at two in the morning. I guess a great time <laughs> to review this. Yes. Um. So, uh, so that is because it's an evolutionary trait and it's because, um, you know, the, the, the person in, in the early humans who was out, you know, enjoying the beauty of a flower with not another thought probably got eaten by a saber toothed cat (laughs) and didn't procreate. So our ancestors who were all edgy and what was that, what was that, um, and created memories um, more quickly, more easily, uh, for things that were negative tended to live. So that's not super helpful now. This is not going to help us survive. It actually just helps us get sort of worked up um, and really cut out the rest of our, our brain and our other ways of accessing information or making decisions because the amygdala hijacks everything. Mm. So um, there are certain things you can do that will bring your prefrontal cortex into uh, activate that, which dampens the amygdala and starts everything working in partnership. Um, One of those things is naming the feeling. So when you feel, especially if you're meditating on this and you're thinking about being with your parents and um, what would be an emotion that would come up, Karen? Um, We could either go, let's go with fear or lack of control. Let's go with yeah. uh, lack of control. You could, yeah, you could do that. So when you're thinking of it, you're thinking of the feeling in your body, especially if you're meditating on it afterward, you might think, oh, this feels like a, a ball in my abdomen, or it feels like, um, like oh, a, a weight on my, my chest. throat, yeah, or a weight. weight on your chest. Yeah. What, exactly right. This feels like a weight on my chest. Um, it, it is fear, or it is lack of control. And just uh, using that language and feeling it in your body activates a different part of your brain and starts dampening the amygdala and creates space. It creates space. So it's not that you'd stop feeling it, but you've got a little space from it. You're not swept up on it. You don't become the emotion. Ah, okay. And the more over time you do this, here's the interesting thing. Over time, the anatomy of your brain actually changes. They've seen it on fMRIs that you actually start changing the amount of the gray matter and the way these things get activated. Ah, so then you, so when you have space from it 
And, and so this isn't really about getting rid of it forever. It's about accepting it and not pushing it down so it doesn't roar back bigger. That's exactly right. So that's, that is the thing. You don't want to think, you know, you may get rid of it. Sometimes you may be sitting there with your parents and you're about to leave and you, you feel that feeling that you felt maybe meditating or that you felt with them certainly many times. You're like, oh, look at that lack of control. I know, recognize that. No. And it, oh, I was, it might, go ahead. It might go away if you think that, or it might not. Okay. It wouldn't, uh, an even better answer would be just to get rid of my parents. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're working around it here, but that's basically what needs to happen, right? Um, okay. And then over time, so over time, all these things get better, a little bit better as we... They do. The, the tricky part is you, if you cling to the outcome, if you think, oh, I'm only doing this because I don't want to feel this anymore, um, it derails it. So even though you know all these things and these might be the reasons you're doing it, you really have to let go of that outcome and just do it for the sake of doing it. Okay. And that's, that's actually good because I think in this uh, world right now, we're all pointed at a deadline or it's cured and there isn't really a cure for being human. That's right. Oh my God. Well said. Yeah. God. Exactly. You exactly. and I would have found it if there was a cure for being. Right. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> okay. So now let's jump into, because I, I feel like this is the root of, first of all, we're brought up in uh, everything, sexuality, morality, ethics, all these things are, um, you know, there was a very interesting show. I can't remember. It was the kid that was, that played Jesse in, um, uh, Breaking Bad, and it was about a cult. But it, in uh, shoot, I can't remember the name. Someone will know. Mm -hmm. Someone will put it in the notes, or I'll get a hundred emails of people telling me what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, but they had this thing where they taught everyone to say exactly what they wanted to say on the second, so that they weren't getting passive aggressive or they weren't calculating. And I thought that's a very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? Because we're really not responsible for other people's feelings, but right. we have been taught to judge everything, including yeah. ourselves. What, is there a tip or a tool to get us out of judgment or good, bad? Um, I was talking to my friend Jessa one day and I love, she said, I have never really met a villain. And I thought, mm -hmm. you know what? That's true. Cause if you really break it down, people are all things. Right. Right. Yeah, but absolutely. How do we break the judgment cycle? So, wow, that's a great, that's a great question. And I, might I will not have an answer, but I, you know, help well, us along. there are tools, but I do, it probably goes back to the same thing that if there's no quick fix or we would have figured that out a while ago, but, um, but yeah, I think what you're saying is so, so important, Karen, um, as the world gets more, uh, broken Judging. down into villains versus non-villains mm -hmm. and everyone's got their different interpretation of it. Um, loving kindness is a part of um, mindfulness. It's a really important meditation that's done um, in the original Pali uh, language of, of Buddhism. It's called metta. And it basically is something along the lines of, you can change these words, but it goes something like this. You think, um, you, you bring a, a loved one to mind, you know, a, a close friend or a family member, something. And you meditate on the words, something to the effect of, may you be safe, may you be healthy, may you be happy, may you be at ease. Uh, and you do that for a while. And then you switch to yourself. The thought was starting with a loved one. It is actually easier to do it for them than it is for yourself. Mm. And then you go to yourself. May I be safe? May I be healthy? May I be happy? May I, may I be at ease? And then you do it for someone who you're indifferent about. And then you would do it for someone who you really dislike. And that's always interesting to really feel those, those uh, phrases right. as you say them. And then you extend it to the whole world. And it's a practice that's sort of pushing the boundaries of your compassion. Um, but here's an interesting uh, thing that I was at a, a uh, retreat um, a, a silent retreat where we did loving kindness meditation just a couple weeks ago. 
And when I got to the part of, of picking my villain, the person I dislike to do that piece of it, mm-hmm. I looked back over the past couple of months, you know, I've done this meditation, not for a while, but many times before that, and usually pretty easily come up with someone who I was feeling irritated enough with that they could <laughs> be my villain. Um, and I, so I thought back over the past couple of months to, you know, let me think of the most uncomfortable conversations I've had and Every time I was the villain, I was the person where it's like, oh, I wish I'd done that differently. Oh, I should have done this. Um, that was really eye opening that I had some work to do on judging myself. I was actually that was my next question, because I I punish myself continually. Um, Mm. it's like when people worry, we don't really know what that achieves, like that you don't get worry points. Right. They don't add up to anything. So when, um, it's funny because I was meditating on like how harshly I judge myself and I have had an issue where I literally screwed up my abdomen because I didn't realize Mm -hmm. I was holding everything so tight and I really Mm -hmm. messed up my digestion and everything. And um, I sort of healed myself with my hands on my stomach, just putting like relaxation in. And the, the, I heard a voice in my head, not a voice outside, say, love yourself like I love you. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. And I think that I try to remember, I say, I will love myself as God loves me. Oh, nice. And um, so that is, that is helpful. But as even as someone who does humor, I know when something somebody humiliated you or something like that, the best mm-hmm. route out of it is to make fun of yourself or um, yeah. to not self deprecating be like, look, I'm an old lady. And I you know what I mean? There's a right. a way out. But it really is. I don't know. It, I, I guess I'm trying to say maybe there isn't an on and off switch there. It's just the practice of being good to yourself. It is. You know, first of all, I think we're cut from the same cloth, Karen. I can <laughs> completely identify that situation. Um, I think what you did uh, saying, I love myself as God loves me, is very much akin to this loving kindness meditation. That's why you start with a dear one, because you can really generate those feelings more, more easily than for yourself. Or in your case, you can really picture how God would see you better than you can picture how you would see you with those feelings of complete acceptance. Yeah. God has a much better opinion of me than Victoria's secrets. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) I think God appreciates me more. (laughs) Um, That's pretty appreciative. I think that um, also, um, you know, when you feel like you said, when you're being hard on yourself, really accepting whatever it was that made you feel hard on yourself and also accepting that you're a person who that you you feel hard on yourself and you're self-deprecating. I do the same thing to try to um, alleviate embarrassment. And I know the other day um, when I sent out an email from work that went to approximately 200 people in three under three organizations. And, um, and I was rushing and afterward realized that it was a, it, there was an inaccuracy in it and I just felt ugh, right. embarrassment, not huge embarrassment because you know, it, it is what it is. But not only that, it felt like that's the only thing people are going to see on the whole thing. And now I'm a phony. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was the phony part. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, you know, regret and self recrimination and all of that. And instead of trying to push it away and say, Oh, it's not that bad. My Lisa, or, and I already did, I admit, joked about it with other people and, oh, well, if this is the least dignified thing I do this month, I'll be lucky, you know, the sort yeah. of thing. Um, but then when I actually didn't try to push them away and just sat down and meditated and let myself feel them and name them and feel where they were in the body, they, it just caused them to dissipate, even though that wasn't my, my goal was simply to accept them. Right. You know, that's something that happens with comedians in the beginning is, and there's 
there's the comedian that invites all their friends and then their friends kind mm. of fake laugh through the whole thing. And then there's sort of the real comedian who's always a little self-conscious. This is terrible to say, but, and they will be like, no, I don't want people from work there. I, I want to get better. I want to be a comedian. Mm. I want to earn the title before everyone comes and everyone wants to come to the show. And you feel like they're, uh, you forget because the comedian's eye is such that of a laser focus on something. You forget that they, they want to come to support you. That's like, I came from this childhood that was so like attacking and um, mm. what's wrong and critical that I think that's all people see. And mm -hmm. it's not. Right. Right. That is really interesting. And just having that insight, too, gives you a little spaciousness from it. Yes, yes. Okay, hang on one second, folks. We're going to be right back. We got, uh, we got a ways to go before we fix you all. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Ashley, and Prithvika is my collection of consciously created crystal and nature forged jewelry. Prithvika translates to of the earth in Hindi, which represents the natural earth made materials I'm working with, along with my personal ancestry and grounded energy. Each piece is created through ceremony and science and completed with being Reiki charged. I'm currently featuring copper mirror necklaces, which can be used for protection and mirror magic. My intention is for your new piece of jewelry to feel like an extension of self to help bring your desires to fruition and to amplify the magic within you. My Instagram is at Prithvika and my website is Prithvika.com. That's P-R-T-H-V-E-E-K-A.com. Okay, so let's start with this term, unexpected mindfulness uh, meditation practices, because you also, when I talked to you, you had some um, really interesting stories um, about, shall we say, things in the other world, but tell us how mindfulness can help us in these other areas. Sure. I think that, you know, there's no, whether it's mindfulness or, or it's um, reading tarot or it's um, you know, channeling, whatever it is, these are all creative expressions, I think, and tools. Um, and one doesn't exclude the other and none are more valid. Um, just in my personal experience, I don't know if this would apply to everyone. I've got a busy doer's brain and really nothing's going to break through there unless I practice mindfulness first and foremost. Um, so, so you mean when you're thinking, because, and here's the other thing, I think, I believe that ADHD is a real thing. Or, a, yeah. you know, it's a real thing and it's probably a real yeah. chemical thing and all that. But I think a lot of people self-diagnose because, and this could help them kind of beat it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. This stillness, uh, practicing this, and I call it stillness, um, Tara Brock, just to take a quick side trail, um, Tara Brock, who's this wonderful meditation teacher, um, and the author uh, has this great analogy. She's talking about pulling together your resources, but I think this also works for finding that area of stillness and meditation is that when she is kayaking down a river and she's feeling unsteady and kind of scared and nervous and she's sort of losing control, she pulls in behind a couple of rocks in the middle of the, uh, the river. And when her kayak is behind those rocks, it's in sort of an eddy. And it's a place of stillness in the river. And when she gets there, she can get herself back in balance, get herself steady, and then go back out into the river again. And to me, a lot of times that is what meditation feels like. Yes, yes. And I think that people are... Um, confused on how long this has to go on. Like people, you can meditate for an hour. That's great. But sometimes one or two minutes is enough, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I know that from the studies done when they're specifically looking at things like um, um, depression or pain or that sort of thing, a lot of the studies use 45 minutes, but most of us don't have 45 minutes in a day. And I'm not saying that 45 minutes isn't wonderful because there are different layers you can get to going longer, but really consistency seems to be 
um, what's most helpful to me. It's not the length of time. Just if, if I could meditate, if I had no other time, but five or 10 minutes, that would be meaningful in my day. Yes. And I also feel like sometimes this is stronger than others, but like I can sort of pick up that tarot deck and clear out my mind in two breaths. Yes. And pull yes. into the moment because of the habit of I pick up that deck and this is what happens. Now I'm on a, a thing where I like to do 15 minutes before. And then in two weeks, that might change too. You could do five or you might do 30, but it's being able to drop into that state of mind. And so the more you do it, the easier it gets. Exactly. And the more you were practicing. So very you very easily get to that state of mind. And that's a, an amazing thing. And it's okay if there are people who don't get to that state of mind easily. It's just the practice, the practice of coming back to it again and again. And like you said, you're trying to use it in the world. It's not just sitting on a cushion that you're trying to use it. Yes. Uh, you know, one of the uh, things I think you were talking about was um, me uh, seeing um, something otherworldly. Yes. Was seeing a very much to my surprise, because this has only happened twice in my life, seeing someone uh, who had passed away. Um, and I had walked into a hospital and it had been cold outside. And I walked in and it was warm. And it was just, I just took a, ah, you know, closed my eyes and took a breath because it, I was still for a moment. All my thoughts stopped. I was just sort of absorbing like, oh, it's nice to be out of the cold and the air and it was like taking a breath and that's when I saw it. So I think that this area of stillness for me is one of the ways that would be a tool for anything else I wanted to do. And, you know, sometimes with synchronicities, I wonder if maybe they were going on my whole life, but I would not have noticed if it fell on top of me. You know, it's a, uh, that part where you said it's like, uh, like, uh, like Ryan said in her YouTube where she was talking is this. So if this is the moment and we empty out everything else, we probably that's where the brain probably has more abilities than we even know. Yeah, right. For yes, I need that. When I was younger and I first got into comedy and I was in my 20s, I decided I was going to be happy. I was so miserable. I just decided. Mm -hmm. And I read this book and um, about how to meditate. And it was an hour a day. And I said, I will do an hour a day. And I did mm -hmm. whatever this, uh, whatever they set up for the rules there was it was I think it was kind of Christian because after you opened your chakras they made you seal them with a cross or it was very elaborate but I did it okay. and um they that was twice I popped out of my body I woke up out of oh, my wow. body looking down at my body and I remember waking up and there was a a guy dressed all in denim looking down at me and so I think it was that may have been like a period where I kind of broke open. Mm. Um, and one of the things I remember, I should stop talking because my podcast is about you, not me. No, but I want to hear. I remember um, we I was on the road and the road is very stressful. You're driving. We had been driving through snow. I was with my friend Debbie and there was uh, we came upon a hotel clerk that was awful and she was not helpful. And somehow her manager came in. And kind of heard me say that, that she wasn't helpful or something. Mm -hmm. And then I, and usually I don't worry because I'm pretty loud. I'm loud when people are great and I'm mm -hmm. loud when people are not. I will tell, mm -hmm. I will call a manager over and go, that was the best waitress I've ever had all the time. I always think it has to be equal. If you're going to complain, you got to say good things. Yeah. And then I felt like, oh, what if that lady lost her job? All this stuff. You just ruined her day. Mm -hmm. And I went into my meditation and I heard a voice say, don't worry. I take care of her, not you. How interesting. Right? Like we have this responsibility for everyone else's feelings and whatnot. Because what if yeah. that, was, what if she was amazing, the best hotel clerk and she had a bad day and her boss was like, eh, whatever, you had a bad day. Like, I don't know. My brain right. went to that negative stuff. Like you just ruined somebody's life. <laughs> right, right. Because, and then ruminate over what might have happened or, yeah, exactly. Right. Because I'm so also, powerful. I'm controlling everyone's life. <laughs> exactly. And it goes toward our wanting to make everyone else comfortable, make everything okay for everyone as well. Ah. At least in my case. Wow. Okay. So when we 
so probably I would say, cause I'm learning that creativity. Well, I'm not learning. I have been saying for a while that art is mandatory now. And then I started painting and it is mandatory to mm. my sanity yeah, right that's now. Wonderful. Yes. I didn't know you were painting. That's wonderful. I, it's like a two, two, I think I started a month, two months ago. I started painting um, bottles and making incense, mm. uh, whatever. All my friends got them. I'll, maybe I'm going to sell them someday because everybody was like, I need five. And I was like, no, you get Amazing. one. Amazing. <laughs> and I think so. I think creativity is a channel. So with that, or like when I sit down to write my jokes, I have to shut everything off because is that that's unlocking that channel in that moment, right? Right. So I, I guess that just speaking experientially from for myself, um, when I can't dredge up anything from whether it's my intuition or creativity or channeling something my creativity, let's say creativity. I'm not sure where everyone stands on that, but it certainly feels to me like it flows through from somewhere other than me. Um, when my mind is busy because nothing is, is allowing something to flow through, it's getting stuck in thoughts. Mm. So when my mind is thinking, Oh yeah, geez, I've got to, I've got to go to the grocery store today. I can't forget to get that. Wait a second. Haven't I been to the grocery store three times? Why haven't sent my husband gone? Isn't it his turn? Yes, I do this. (laughs) You know, this whole thing, and then suddenly I'm thinking about something that happened three years ago. Um, that's not a place where I can easily feel creative. Um, and from what I've heard from others as well, really practicing getting to that point of stillness allows you, like you did, said you do with your tarot reading, then you can automatically, when you need it, find that stillness. Wow. So I used to, um, there was another meditation teacher I knew, uh, and I'm, uh, I might be looping meditation and stillness too much into one group here, but I would tell her, I used to feel like, uh, I just would go into pudding. I needed a nothingness. I would see my body floating in pudding and I couldn't be just space because mm. I, that would not, I could, it had to be like just a black space or a brown space. And it was a good thing, but it was the way I would get everything else out of my mind. And Hmm. a meditation teacher told me, oh, that's like level four of the meditation layers. And I never found out what that meant. Does that make any sense? Are there meditation Um, layers? So there are, there are two things that I want to say to that. One is I'm not sure if she might have been referring to just the fact that you are sort of transcending your thoughts, but it is, um, I think it's, it's a little bit erroneous to believe that we have to transcend our thoughts in meditation. Uh, that is one way to just get yourself really thinking about how you can't transcend your thoughts. And when you say transcend, does that mean erase or uh, yeah so sometimes people think when they're meditating oh i shouldn't think that's bad oh here i am thinking again i i've done that many times myself oh gosh here i am thinking again so you know when you're trying to meditate maybe you're you are inputting someone else might be focusing on their breath or candle um and then suddenly you find yourself thinking about the grocery store or what that person said yesterday or what you forgot to do and then you think oh there i am thinking again and then you try to go back to what you were thinking before. Um, that is um, that sometimes can feel frustrating. That oh, I'm thinking again. I'm not meditating. Mm-hmm. But actually, that is the practice of meditating: is bringing yourself back to whatever it was you were you might be using as an anchor, um, or whatever technique you're using for meditating. To when you find yourself, oh look, I'm swept up in thoughts again. Um, to bring yourself back to the breath or whatever it is you were using, that that is actually a beautiful thing. The practice is bringing yourself back over and over. That's a huge part of mindfulness is sort of learning. So you have this beautiful moment of awakening. Oh, look, I'm in my thoughts. I'm not my thoughts. And that's a beautiful thing to happen. Uh, Wow. I, when I saw there was a, um, there was a psychic I saw when I was a cigarette called very young in Vegas. And she said, uh, you want to just set a timer for one minute. And she mm-hmm. said, hold nothing. And as soon as a thought comes in your mind, just go to the number one and then hold that until another thought comes in your mind and go, just go to two and just keep going 
for one minute and see how low you can keep that number. And she said, I don't know if this is real. This kind of makes sense to me, though. She said, at the point that you can hold the number one for 60 seconds, um, or you start with one, you don't start with zero. Maybe you start with zero. Either way, the point that you can hold for 60 seconds, she says, you have built uh, a protective and charismatic energy that she was like, that's the energy as a performer. Just do that every day. Do this one minute thing and you're going to like build charisma. I don't know if that's how she said it, but that's how I heard it. Um, I think we do build up our energy with that type of, Mm -hmm. don't we? Doesn't that help us protect us a little bit? That's a, that's a really weird question that wound into three spaces. (laughs) I'm not sure what you mean about protecting us. I think it definitely helps us focus and find that stillness and, um, and come to a different place. I would, um, be thoughtful about the fact that as soon as you start saying, I need to do this for this period of time, Uh, you're starting to judge what you can't do. Oh, I got to three. Oh, I thought I was going to do one today. I got to three. Oh my God. I did three yesterday. I did 20 today. What is wrong with me? Oh, that's brilliant. Okay. And the one other thing is that this popped up from Tricycle Magazine, someone by the name of Dra- uh, Brad Warner, I think, said the the only way one really gets any of the most important benefits of meditation practice is by giving up on the notion that there are any benefits of meditation practice. Ah, okay. So it just it can't be a it can't be a goal. It's just a thing. It that's yeah. It it can derail you um, in your efforts. Otherwise, you know, I think it's I, David Nick Turn said it's fine. Any reason that brings you to mindfulness, meditation, yoga, whatever it is, your reason for being all these reasons. Like I want to be more creative. I want to um, find stillness for for whatever reason. Um, all these are great reasons to go toward that uh, area. But then once you get there, you kind of have to give up your thought of any outcomes, your attachment. Because as soon as you get attached and start to cling on to it, that clingingness will get in the way of what you're trying to do. Okay. And also, uh, what kind of a magazine is Tricycle? I love that name. Yeah, it's a Buddhist magazine. Oh, why did they call it Tricycle? I don't really know. I don't know much about it, but I saw that little (laughs) quote and I thought that really... (laughs) That really uh, was something I needed to hear today. I'm glad I saw that quote. Oh, that is. It was perfect. Um, Also, uh, this may be, but I, if we can calm our mind like that or try to try to do mindfulness, I guess, or do mindfulness, not try, just do mindfulness, right? Yeah. Um, Yeah. Before we go to sleep. Mm. Okay. Is that another can of worms or another good, uh, you, you, I'm going to let you elaborate on that. Uh, yeah, I, I actually have been talking to some people recently about waking up and there just seems to be so much anxiety in the world right now. I know that we're all feeling it, but it doesn't seem to be dissipating from, from my perspective, or at least the I folks agree. I'm involved with. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are talking to me more than ever before about waking up at, you know, one, two, three in the morning and just feeling anxious. And sometimes they know why, sometimes they don't know why. Um, and what, what they can do about it. So, uh, certainly some of the, uh, meditations that just bring you back to the breath, uh, but even the practice of, um, of allowing that anxiety, it, I actually had that happen to me a couple nights ago and it was anxiety for no reason whatsoever. And I don't, I don't wake up and have trouble falling back asleep. Um, in the past couple of years, I, I get back to sleep pretty easily, but I woke up and had this experience of anxiety and just that sort of interest. Oh, that's interesting. That's, that's curious. I wonder why I'm feeling anxiety. Isn't that interesting? And just sort of allowing it and being interested in it made it, my heart stop beating so hard and made everything calm down. Oh, so that's better than hitting yourself in the head. That's what I do. Right. <laughs> hitting yourself in the head might be second. <laughs> go to sleep. Go to sleep. Um, this is wonderful. Um, just any last minute um, advice you can give to people or, um, again, the things that you would learn at a two-year class. It's just, it's just uh, always something different, but we think it's the yeah. same thing. 
Uh, yeah, I think, I don't know. I'm, I'm really interested myself in what will come of this two-year class. I just know there are people who know a lot more than I do, and I want to learn from them. Um, but I would say that people who are interested in exploring this, not to be intimidated by it at all. Um, if you get online, you can find a lot about mindfulness meditations. You can find a lot about mindfulness techniques, how to apply mindfulness just in your day-to-day life. Uh, you know, one little exercise I love to do when everything seems to be going to hell in a a handbasket in a day, um, and you're just in the middle of it is just stop and just get really quiet and listen for five sounds. Like just be very quiet, close your eyes and think, Oh, I can hear someone walking around downstairs. Oh, I can hear the hum of the refrigerator. Just go on until you hear five sounds. And it really just takes you out of your thoughts and your head and into that mindful space and sort of gives you a taste of what it's like. Oh, I love that. I really love that. I can do that. Uh, uh, Maya Lisa King, uh, this has been wonderful. And you don't you don't necessarily have a website or anything, but I don't. I work, I just do word of mouth. And that's been working out great as it should. And if anybody wants to uh, have a question or um, you uh, want to hire Maya Lisa, uh, it's Maya Lisa King at yahoo.com, right? That's correct. We are the last two people on Yahoo. We are holding on tight, aren't we? <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes. It's not, don't let it go away. Everything I, <laughs> is attached to that. And also, uh, maybe just uh, if you loved this episode, drop her an email and tell her how great it was. Oh, thank you, Karen. Thank you so much for having me on. This was a lot of fun. Awesome. I loved it. All right, everybody. <laughs> Thanks to Mike at Uno Rising Media. Um, everybody, we will see you next week. Hope to see you on the Patreon. Uh, have a very mindful week and remember who you are. Bye, everybody. Paranormal Karen. She's a spooky kind of queen.